Finally, <coughs> um, sorry, <laughs> um, Bob Kuttner um, is a co-founder and co-editor of the American Prospect, professor of social policy uh, at Brandeis, um, written lots of books, um, and uh, taught at lots of places uh, as well. Um, and um, recently, perhaps uh, also well known as Steve Bannon's uh, new friend. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I particularly want to salute uh, Mary Kay and Randy, who I think get this about as well as anybody does, uh, the need for us to listen to each other with open ears and open hearts and to try and keep coalitions together with a sense of empathy and a sense of integrity. Um, if we don't, white identity politics will defeat us all. And you can hear it on the panel this morning. That, that is uh, the challenge. The, the new uh, issue of the prospect, a few copies of which are out in the lobby, uh, the cover line is the American heartbreak. Uh, that's from a short poem by Langston Hughes, I'm going to read the whole poem. I am the American heartbreak, the rock on which freedom stumped its toe, the great mistake that Jamestown made long ago. And the, the cover piece is by Randy Kennedy, and the title is Despair is Not an Option. And it's not. But rage is not an option either. Rage is a necessity. And somehow we need to fuse those two sentiments uh, acknowledging that despair is not an option and acknowledging that there is all too much reason for rage and somehow fusing that into a coherent politics. I want to use my uh, remaining nine and a half minutes uh, <laughs> to talk about globalization. Uh, there's a whole catalog of assaults on democracy, one of which is the use of globalization to destroy democracy. Uh, the book that I have coming out in early 2018 is called Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism? And to spare you from having to buy the book, I can tell you the answer, it cannot. And so the solution is to have less capitalism and less elite globalism or we will continue losing our democracy and we will continue being played off against one another. Um, the book makes a few simple points. One, the post-war era was exceptional in the history of capitalism for reasons that partly reflected struggle and partly were happy accidents. Uh, the ruling class had disgraced itself in 1929. Uh, Roosevelt was more radical than recent democratic presidents and he did a pretty good job of leashing capital and empowering labor at least for a while. And uh, fortuitously, uh, the right had disgraced itself in Europe. It took a war to do that. And so you come out of World War II with an unusually leftish version of capitalism that had a half-life of about 30 years before elites recovered their usual power. And a lot of us grew up thinking that this was the new normal. It was not. It was an interlude. And uh, globalization was used as the hammer to destroy the kind of mixed economy that we enjoyed for maybe 30 years. Now, there was a great deal wrong with it. It continued to be racist, it continued to be colonialist, and it continued to suppress women. But compared to any other uh, period in the history of capitalism, there was more class solidarity, more class uplift than before or since, and it was a period in which democracy was being expanded rather than contracted. Uh, precisely because financial elites were constrained. 70s, the turmoil was used to suppress a lot of that, and so capitalism as usual came roaring back, with a result, much like the 1920s, that when you take away people's livelihoods and you play off groups against each other, you get neo-fascism. And uh, that, it, it's no coincidence that that's happening in the US and in Europe uh, where neo-fascist parties are now the second or third largest party in former social democracies. And it's happening because it's all one system. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the trading system, so-called, is not really about trade deals at all. It's about the use of uh, ostensible trade law to make it easier to deregulate labor and deregulate capital and to destroy the polity as a venue where 
empowered citizens can at least fire owner of, of, of fight owners of capital to a draw and make a, a, a version of social democratic capitalism that is, is bearable. That is gone. And there was a 40-year period when people's livelihoods were gradually being taken away from him, them. And in the, in the absence of a credible uh, left alternative, uh, eventually something like Trumpism fills the vacuum in all of our countries. Now, the default of um, center-left parties, particularly in the 1990s, is a huge part of this story. And that also is no coincidence. Uh, in the United States, uh, Bill Clinton did more to deregulate finance and less to empower labor than most Republican presidents. In um, Britain, uh, where Tony Blair uh, was the new labor uh, prime minister, um, he embraced most of Thatcherism. Margaret Thatcher was asked in an interview what she thought her greatest achievement was, and she paused and she said, it was Tony Blair. <laughs> Uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, Gerhard Schroeder, the Social Democratic Prime Minister, um, implemented an anti-labor uh, program that would have made conservatives blush. And so when the crash comes in 2008 and people look around for a global opposition party, there isn't one. And so in the aftermath of that, um, you have neo-fascists coming to the fore just as in the 1920s. Now, is there any good news here, or should we all just, you know, kill ourselves? Um, I think if there's any good news in this whole mess, it's in the United States. Because um, a lot of the backlash <clears throat> is about the fear of other. And other includes people of different races, different ethnic groups. It includes fear of terrorists. Um, as bad as we are in the United States at relating to other, Europe is worse. Uh, we actually have, at times in our history, made an effort to have different groups understand each other, and even if they don't like each other, work in coalition. We see this in our better unions. We see this in cities that have multiracial coalitions like LA or New York that are progressive coalitions, multiracial coalitions, coalitions that work uh, together with strong trade unions. And one of the really interesting things about Trump, and my friend Bannon likes to talk about the deep state, the, the administrative state, otherwise known as the US Constitution, <laughs> so far, so far, the deep state is kind of holding, right? He's not able to govern, I mean, he's, he's crazy, he's psychotic, he's vicious, but he's not able to govern by decree. Um, he is actually punting issues like DACA, and now, like Iran, to Congress. So separation of powers, if anything, is becoming stronger. Uh, Bannon, I talked to Bannon again yesterday, and Bannon's mission is to blow up the Republican Party. He thinks that if he can uh, run primary opponents against <clears throat> uh, incumbent Republicans and somehow get, <clears throat> I'm sorry, get, get Republicans elected who will embrace his form of economic nationalism, he can turn the Republicans into a party of the working class. He can fuse white identity politics with economic nationalism politics. Now, that is uh, diabolically clever. The problem is there aren't any Republicans like that. Uh, he, he thinks he's going to convert Roy Moore, who you know ran as a racist, uh, God's gun and gays. Somehow he's going to turn him into uh, Sherrod Brown. Not going to happen. And so <clears throat> the good news here is if our side gets its act together, these people are very vulnerable because they're not solving anybody's problems. <clears throat> so it's up to us to, prevent, to, present, to present something better, and I hope uh, we can do that at this conference. Thank you. You can do it.